So I've mentioned on a few occasions that for this upcoming console generation, we've really left that peak console war discussion. Sony's going to do predictably well with PS5. Microsoft's going in a different direction with Game Pass. But this news today, uh, if it wasn't interesting before, it certainly is now. So if you didn't see, and I don't know how you didn't, but Microsoft recently announced that they have acquired uh, Bethesda's parent company, Zenimax Media, for $7.5 billion dollars this is about as big as it gets when we come to studio acquisitions or company acquisitions because this is zenimax media which has many subsidiaries and those subsidiaries include bethesda game studios its software uh, zenimax online arcane studios machine games tango gameworks alpha dog games i believe they do just some mobile stuff but that's another studio and then roundhouse studios as well these include many large franchises that I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with. Elder Scrolls, The Elder Scrolls Online, Fallout, Wolfenstein, Doom, Dishonored, The Evil Within, Prey, Rage, Quake, Starfield. That IP will be included as well. Uh, technically, this also includes the two timed exclusives for PlayStation 5 that are launching, Ghostwire uh, Tokyo and uh, Deathloop. This really is a substantial acquisition, increasing Microsoft's first party studios from 15 to 23, bringing in an additional 2,300 employees. In the announcement write up from Xbox head Phil Spencer, he says, we will be adding Bethesda's iconic franchises to Xbox Game Pass for console and PC. One of the things that has me most excited is seeing the roadmap with Bethesda's future games, some announced and many unannounced to Xbox consoles and PC, including Starfield, the highly anticipated new space epic currently in development by Bethesda Game Studios. So what does this deal look like for Sony, for Microsoft, exclusive games moving forward, timed exclusives, Xbox Game Pass? This like we said, it's it's as big as it gets. Seven and a half billion dollars. This is more than Microsoft paid for Mojang 2014, more than what Disney paid for Lucasfilm. I mean, this was even this is even bigger than when we were humoring those rumors about Microsoft being interested in buying WB Interactive or even Sony looking into Liu Technologies. Now those would have been pretty big in their own right. And uh, in certain respects, it would have made sense for those companies if they really went through with those purchases. But that's nothing compared to the, the studios that we're talking about, the, the talent, the IP that's up for grabs here. And this is going to be finalized by the second quarter of 2021. So the two timed exclusives on PS5, Microsoft has already confirmed that they will honor that commitment. And this is what we saw when they acquired other studios where there was some slight overlap for PlayStation 4 releases. That was really kind of expected. This is something where it's a, it's a massive deal but in the short term there might not be much immediate change in fact the real question of course and what we'll be talking about here is what does that long term look like when we're well past current games that are being made current commitments current contracts the the real short term immediate benefit is that if you are a game pass subscriber you're getting that back catalog of all these games from all these these major ip and that's that's huge that's an incredible value boost to game pass i mean we never really had to argue or argue against game pass and the value that it proposed here it's it's excellent you can't deny it and so to have this catalog of titles being added and the expectation that moving forward for all these developers and all these games it's going to be day and date with that monthly subscription again it's super aggressive it's super consumer friendly i mean even if you don't want to get into xbox hardware it's available on pc but first, let's actually talk about how Bethesda has um, publicly responded to this uh, or acknowledged the, the agreement actually being in place here. We've got uh, Bethesda's Pete Hines where he says uh, in a write-up uh, from Bethesda.net, Today, it changed again, and I know that brings up questions. He's referencing all the things that we've already discussed here. But the key point is, we're still Bethesda. We're still working on the same games we were yesterday, made by the same studios we've worked with for years, and those games will be published by us. Then, on a separate post from Todd Howard, he says, like our original partnership, he's referencing when they first shipped on the original Xbox back in the day, this one is about more than one system or one screen. We share a deep belief in the fundamental power of games and their ability to connect, empower, and bring joy, and a belief that we should bring that to everyone, regardless of who you are, where you live, or what you play on, regardless of the screen size, the controller, or your ability to even use one. Now, those two quotes weren't all that revealing, and to be honest, that's expected to have a canned response or something more ambiguous for what is an incredibly massive deal where you could easily throw hundreds of questions at them to try to get an answer about the implications of a deal like this. But what we can surmise and what we've already heard from Phil Spencer is that for the most part, at least right now, these teams are going to function 
more independently as if nothing really even happened. This acquisition will take place and they will continue operations as they have been. Microsoft's not going to intervene and say, you need to do this with an IP that we already have, or we want you to, you know, do some other work for uh, one of our established studios that we currently have, things like that, right? This is really an acquisition. Bethesda will continue to publish their titles and uh, operate like they normally would. Of course, this still doesn't answer everybody's burning questions of what does this mean for PlayStation long term? Will we see these games ship and release on PlayStation? PlayStation. So going back to Phil Spencer's recommitment of those two timed exclusives still releasing on PlayStation 5, so Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop, he does mention specifically for the future, Bethesda titles would release on Xbox, PC, and quote, other consoles on a case-by-case -case basis. So naturally, there is this initial fear that for some of these big studios or IP that you're really interested in for their sequels or any new IP that you might see from some of your favorite studios, uh, will those still release on PlayStation? Well, we already know that uh, certain games are probably still going to see release. It's just a matter of what. I mean, when Phil Spencer mentions uh, other consoles on a case-by-case -case basis, I mean, we only have three console manufacturers. <laughs> that's that's Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo. Granted, Nintendo certainly makes sense here as well. Microsoft has shipped plenty of games uh, on Nintendo Switch recently, and so that is a platform that certainly makes sense for certain games. But um, this is actually some pretty um, consistent messaging with what they've been doing for some of the recent acquisitions. Now it's just a, a matter of what does that case by case basis look like? And there's where the conversation really starts to unfold because is it a, a matter of the next Fallout, Starfield, Elder Scrolls? You know, are we gonna see these major games be exclusive to Xbox and PC? Will they ship on PlayStation? And this is uh, initially where I would say that more than likely, uh, the problem is this is a seven and a half billion dollar transaction and the idea is for all these games to be day and date on game pass and you know we've already had talks about this where it's kind of incredible how they're running game pass and the amount of games that they're giving out we just had a recent statement from sony doubling down and how that that model does not work for playstation sony can ship five million copies of these games at a 60 now upcoming $70 price tag, whereas Microsoft usually can't do that. They don't normally have the IP for that. Now, granted, they do have it now, and that's uh, something we'll get to in a second here, but at least for Sony, when we talk about this, they can ship 5 million at full price. Even after a few MSRP cuts over the lifetime of a game, they can go over 10, 15 million copies. And so it that model doesn't work. Um, and there is a tipping point, you know, depending on a project a game's projected sales and how it could do for being bol how how it could do for bolstering a subscriber base. Uh, there is that tipping point where it might make more sense to try and go for an aggressive um, accumulation of subscribers on a monthly payment plan. And arguably for Microsoft, this is why they've gone the Game Pass route. They just can't move IP like Sony does. They can't move hardware to supplement moving that much IP like Sony does. It's just fact. That's what we have right now. And so it's not even so much a matter of Microsoft conceding to Sony, like we can't sell this much hardware, so we'll do this instead. But they're just taking a different approach and they're exploring an area that's still very much emerging. That's why a lot of publishers are exploring subscription models. That's why outside of the games business, subscriptions work and it's very favorable for a lot of other um, sectors and so microsoft is doing their best to to get in there early and again they're going to scale they don't care if they lose money for the current model that they're looking at right now and that's the thing seven and a half billion dollars for what is heavily bolstering game pass now that'll be great for game pass and i can assure you this is certainly going to guarantee even more subscribers for the service. They're at a little over 15 million and still growing. That's a lot, especially for their install base and having it available on PC. But, you know, they want to get that to 30, 35, 40 million. They've been actually pretty open about even offering Game Pass on other consoles that aren't just, you know, Xbox, the, the family of Xbox consoles. That's what they're going for right now. And so this really also goes back to the talk that we've had about Sony exploring PC releases. It's, it's weird that people don't seem to understand this, but a software sale is a software sale. It doesn't really matter where it is. The traditional console model is you sell at a loss for brand new hardware to sell software. Nowadays, most of their money comes from software sales, network services, uh, storefront revenue, microtransactions, season passes. I mean, it's all that stuff. It's very little hardware, to be honest. Now, granted, it keeps you in that ecosystem and encourages, encourages you to buy third-party software, but if you're doing a, a subscription model, then you might not be as concerned with selling a third-party game just 
on its own, you'd be more concerned with making sure that that person is subscribed to that service and they can use it at their own leisure. And so it stands to reason that for some major, major IP like Elder Scrolls, Starfield, uh, Fallout, um, maybe even the smaller games, who knows? But it, it stands to reason that those games could actually finance a lot of this deal. Because uh, if this is what we're looking at here, where they're day and date on Game Pass, they still ship on PlayStation. If you choose to play on PlayStation 5, you're going to have to pay $70 for a brand new Bethesda game. Whereas on Microsoft, you get it day one for $15 a month. And that's the, the choice Microsoft might be willing to give people because whether you buy it on PlayStation for $70 or subscribe to Game Pass, it's money in their wallet. This is why I'm inclined to say that we could still keep seeing PlayStation releases for some of these major titles that would be evaluated on that case-by-case -case basis. Just like the Minecraft Mojang situation, Microsoft was acutely aware that it would have been strange to pull that game away from PlayStation or cease content support. You've got big titles coming up that can easily sell millions of copies on PS5 at $70. And more importantly, that won't take away from Microsoft's key goal with this purchase, which is securing the Game Pass catalog for all these back games out of Bethesda suite, but titles moving forward. And they've pretty much guaranteed that these games will not come to a PlayStation subscription-based service. So no PS Plus, no PS Now moving forward. Whenever there's current deals that expire for, let's say, Fallout 4 and that PlayStation Plus collection coming up, or whatever's available on PS Now right now, whenever, you know, those expire and leave that service, they won't come back. They definitely won't come back. Microsoft is preparing for a more long-term future where we're looking at most people subscribing to a service. Sony hasn't really been as aggressive with that approach. And so now, whether we see games release on PS5 or not, Microsoft's already you know, sealed their fate with a, a very large publisher with a lot of fantastic games under their belt. And that's the major difference here. I can easily see them continue releasing on PS5 as if no acquisition really took place, but I certainly don't see anything by way of whatever Sony tries to offer for a subscription model. I don't see these games coming to PS Now ever again, or PlayStation Plus. I mean, that's... I think that's like the real loss here. Whether we see regular retail releases or not is one thing, but for sure, Microsoft has made a, a pretty big uh, bet on subscription. Sony's still going to do well with PlayStation 5. They're still going to sell a lot of these consoles, uh, just that if Microsoft said straight up these games are exclusive moving forward that would make it much more interesting i'm not gonna lie and it's good it breathes competition in the market so i mean that would be interesting to see that play out now funnily enough we also heard from the former senior editor at game informer and now currently kind of funny co-host mentioned on twitter that uh, fun note sony had been negotiating timed exclusivity on starfield as recently as a few months ago going to guess either those talks are done or the price suddenly went way way up and if you recall imran khan is also one of the initial sources we had for sony being very aggressive with third-party deals and uh, that final fantasy 16 was also potentially a game that he had heard was going to be timed exclusive now we know that was true right because that news actually came to fruition and uh, we had multiple sources suggesting that, though. But that really tells us that uh, Sony is pretty much courting every single publisher that they can talk to and see what kind of deal that they can work out. And that would have been pretty substantial just on its own. Not even so much acquiring all this talent, but just getting uh, timed exclusivity for one particular game. Uh, although, it, it, again, it could get interesting. And that's what's great about this is uh, <laughs> things have really been shaken up. Um, it, this has been, you know, like I keep saying, it's peak console war. It really has. 360 PS3 was very heated. Going into PS4 and X1 was heated. Once we were three years into that generation, and now going into this one, it's it was very clear how this was going to look moving forward. But, you know, this was a big one. So, kudos to Microsoft and uh, their commitment to the Xbox customer. I think you're you're crazy to not get Game Pass for PC or pick up a series x or series s when you have the extra cash down the road if you're you know still adamant about getting a ps5 thank you all for joining me in on this conversation i hope you enjoyed if you haven't yet please subscribe for the best playstation news reviews and updates that are here on youtube you can follow me on twitter at mystic ryan and that is it i will see you all in my next video you take it easy